I'll be using a canvas for this demonstration. I advise that you find a surface comparable to the surface you intend to use for the finished illustration, just to keep the problems similar in solution finding, as well as show you how the colors really look in the end. Paint larger thumbnails as you'll see here, when the subject and or the environment are a bit more complex. Use a variety of brushes to achieve the end goal of clarity and legibility. Paint shapes, not things, to avoid the drawing trap. Paint loosely so there is nothing precious about what is painted. This will actually free you up mentally to take painterly chances we so often want and stray away from in our finishes for lack of vision, which is fueled by a lack of experience trying. I have my reasons, which I might explain later, but instead of starting color formulas with monochromes, I wanted to start this one a little more complex. For this formula, I'll be painting from a split complementary color scheme, starting with yellow-orange on the 12 color wheel, with pure blue and purple as the complementary split. To do this right, I first need to mix these three specific hues from the wheel, not picking almost hues from the tubes I have to choose from, but to actually mix these three hues. If you haven't made your own color wheel before, then you might not know which hues are used to make each swatch, and you'll be guessing in the beginning. For the yellow orange, I'm using Cad Yellow Pale and Cad Yellow Orange from my color theory palette. To make the true blue, Ultramarine and Cerulean are used together to neutralize each other's biased temperatures. For the purple, I use Ultramarine Blue and Alizarin Crimson first, touching it with some red rose to neutralize the amount of warmth found from both the Ultramarine and the Alizarin Crimson. I am adding white to the hues to adjust them so they are similar, if not identical in value, before mixing them together to ensure I maintain the value of the hue I'm distinguishing by mixture. Once these three hues are mixed, I'll then make the value strings for each hue. The darker the out of the tube hues are, the longer or more expanded the value range will be when generating the tint strings. Part of this dynamic range is of course the value out of the tube. The other factor involved is the chemistry of the pigments. As much as this time spent with the mixtures might feel like extra labor that we don't want in the process, if you were to rethink it, like as if it were a warm-up process, getting all the bugs out of the system, warming up the hands, the eyes, getting in touch with the tools, finding the game plan that fits this particular need, and then create the execution, you'll find it to be engaging and a big part of the process rather than an add-on or an appendage that we really don't want. It's the color rehearsal before the final performance. It's separating two different and major tasks from each other so you don't disrupt either flow. Mixing is its own act. Thinking like a chemist. Thinking a little like the guy at the hardware store who mixes the paints together in formulas and recipes specific to the palette we have here today. Painting, whether a thumbnail or a finish, is a dance of sorts. With a fully finished palette, all the options are available and there's no feeling of painting blindly. The only thing left is to decide how the painting needs to feel in the end. The brushwork. The stuff we really want to focus on. I'm going to show you three different outcomes using the same three hues picked with modifications to each approach. It's amazing how much variety can be found when limiting your palette choices. One slight modification and a new range of hues can be achieved. Separating the processes also helps keep the tools much cleaner. Using your painting brush to mix colors pollutes and corrupts the brush from being clean and optimal for each new hue added. It gets particularly frustrating when working with easily polluted hues, like yellow, and we can never achieve a clean rendition because it's constantly shifting towards green or orange with even the slightest mixture of anything from the palette. It's hard enough to try not to get the colors on the surface to mix, let alone never being able to start with a clean mixture because of what's hidden within the brush. Once the strings are all built, look for any gaps, any missing values that can be made. Can any of them go any darker? Can any of them go any lighter, closer to whitish, now that you know what your lightest one looks like? This first version of three is favoring the yellow as the big color of the design, creating a semi-polluted atmosphere in the evening glow. 
with the temperature of the piece shifting towards a cooler temperature with blue as the last hue in the chain, or the closest hue to us, emulating the evening sky the opposite direction of the sun. You know, that electric blue color. The background uses the entire value range I mixed for the yellow-orange, and to extend it, I sorta kinda needed to mix the purple in with it to create an off-yellow or off-orange to serve as a slightly darker value in the piece, and as a color transition to the cooler hues in the foreground. In the foreground, I mix the purple and the blue together, as well as isolate each hue to give me a third hue for more variety. It's still purple, it's just a slightly cooler purple. I save the darkest values for the subject matter and use the complementary hues to define the subject, purple against yellow. I also adjusted the angle of the board Jack, the character is writing, to send him downward and forward instead of to screen right. For the second color scheme, I added black to the lineup. Version 1 has no black to stay within the defined graphic range, within the color gamut of those three hues. Version 2 breaks this by adding more hues to the mixture selection. Had I mixed the blue and yellow in the first version, I'd have added a fourth distinct hue to the idea of a true split complementary color scheme with only three hues. The dirty orange I added to the first version sort of does the same thing, except the mixtures don't really shift towards orange because of the blue component in the purple, so they always remain purplish, kind of like a yellowed purple. In the second painting, I use blue as the big color or overall pictorial key color, with the yellow as the pop color for the focus. The black helps push the picture to a full value range, but also introduced a new hue, green, both warm and cool to the scene. Since black is added to all three hues, while the purple cools off with it, and the blue also just basically cools off with it, the yellow shifts towards the green family. Depending upon whether the mixture has more yellow in it or more yellow orange shifts the overall temperature of the green made. And of course, adding blue will push it even cooler. Trying to stay as true as possible to the split complementary color scheme, I use the green and orange-like extra mixtures as accents so they don't shift the scheme too far from its primary goal, split complementary. While adding green is optically not a bad thing, technically, or coming from the formula, this pushes the picture towards a tetradic color scheme instead of keeping it split complementary. I'm using blue as the distant hue, warming up the buildings with the purple hue, kind of using the purple as a red shift of sorts. The yellows are then separated entirely as graphic shapes. The stripe is tinted in the foreground to reduce its power, reserving the strongest accents for Jack's shirt. The green added to the left and right are both different temperatures to reduce the visual pattern. And a small accent of green is added to the yellow stripe of the cast shadow on the ground from the skater. This last thumbnail version is done with both black and white, but treating the split complementary as a way of minimizing the palette for a full spectrum painting, meaning I'm looking for a new minimal palette and I'm using split complementary to find the colors for that minimal palette, which means anything goes as far as the mixtures are concerned, starting though with black and white, the yellow, orange, blue, and purple as my starting hues for my palette. So I'm basically creating my tube hues that I can then use for my painting. I'm pushing to achieve full sunlight in the piece minus a true red. All the other hues are present as a relative palette or a palette achieved by this limited family of hues. Nothing will feel out of place, chromatically displaced or out of harmony. Having black and white on the palette to work with helps to achieve a full value look, perfect for a midday look with the strong sunlight. As long as I stay true to the temperature shift real light produces, I should be able to maintain a sunlit look throughout. Using more blues in the extended background at much lighter values helps set back the space as well as helping to visually design a pattern to break up the space, and hopefully extend the distance even further. The full value range is saved for Jack as well as the most chromatic version of each hue, giving him two focal devices to ensure he remains the focal point in the piece. 
Limiting the palette helps us be more decisive with our color choices and more decisive in our palette construction. Within the limits, there's a lot of variety to work with, as you have seen here in part. If I change the time of day to dusk, night, four o'clock with long shadows, a foggy day, this palette could be used to generate a version of what we need if we're willing to search for it. This was just one of 12 color versions from the 12 hue color wheel with this split complementary color scheme. Imagine an even more expanded wheel and how many more variations you can create from that. I hope this begins to show you the unlimited potential of color control you can have if you really immerse yourself into your color theory.